Retired Sergeant Major Eric Miardis is a first-generation Cuban-American born in Halea, Florida. He is an accomplished former special operator and intelligence professional with 29 years combined experience in the United States Marine Corps and United States Army. He spent over 23 years serving within the United States Army Special Operations and Intelligence Community in a variety of leadership positions, tactical and strategic assignments. He has led and conducted sensitive operations across multiple combat and contingency operations. Eric's career achievements include serving on numerous sensitive overseas contingency operations, counter-narcotic, counter-terrorism, and hostage rescue operations, as well as combat operations through Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom. He is certified and experienced in signals intelligence, computer network operations, human intelligence access operations, and is a certified U.S. Army interactive on-net ION operator, as well as a JSOC CNO operator. Sergeant Major Mirardis received his Associate of Arts degree in foreign languages with a Caribbean Spanish emphasis from the Monterey Peninsula College. His Bachelor's and Master's of Science in Cybersecurity from the University of Maryland University College. He is currently pursuing a PhD in Cyberpsychology from Capital Technology University and is a 2023 National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellow. He is passionate about the significance of the human being more important than the hardware. For years, he has conducted research on how to make our operators more resilient to warfare demands. His academic short-term goal is to conduct research focused on understanding and measuring the cognitive impacts on military and civilian offensive cyber operators while improving resilience in cyber operators within the landscape of strategic and high-risk environments. In addition, he will explore human-machine teaming to accelerate tactical decision-making by increasing situational awareness, reducing cognitive load, simplifying mission dynamics, assisting in the design and execution of full-spectrum cyberspace capabilities, minimizing error, and increasing effectiveness. His long-term goals are completing his PhD in cyberpsychology and integrating his research and solutions to support U.S. national security. And now, I will turn it over to Eric. Thank you, Matthew. Um, it, it's a great delight uh, and an honor to be here speaking um, to, to this group and being able to sort of share what I am um, at the moment working on, which is sort of this life journey, right, to, for a PhD. But it's, uh, it, it's key to me because it helps me um, reflect on, on my career and what I am trying to do. And so what I'm trying to do um, is help the human behind the keyboard, the offensive cyber operator who I assess <laughs> are having great difficulties uh, on sort of the cognitive level on, on the work that they're doing. And so as you explained with my background, I spent uh, a fairly large amount of my life in the military from doing uh, infantry work to within special operations. And within, within that, then I focused heavily on intelligence work. And I had the great opportunity in early 2003 to work in computer network operations. And so that's essentially where I started my career in understanding what it meant to be sort of a hacker, you know, or an offensive cyber operator, or a CNO operator. And I started then the, the, the journey. And, and it was tough because it was right during the global war on terrorism. So that line of work changed significantly from the perspective of doing cyberspace operations from remote sanctuary locations to ultimately where we ended up taking it to conducting these operations in, in, in combat zones all the way to non-permissive areas, which were a lot more difficult. And so throughout you know, the, the 20 years of the global war on terrorism, I spent a lot of time developing capabilities for within special operations and intelligence in order to be able to do, as you mentioned, signals intelligence, computer network operations, even open source intelligence tools. So we can use them in a variety of ways. And to 
to be able to enable these offensive and strategic uses of cyber. So within that, still being a military person and, and, a, and a special operator, I, I, um, I took a lot of the tolls of war, right? So the jumping out of airplanes, getting beat up by, you know, different levels of training to being shot at, engaged in combat. And, and a lot of these actually were doing some sensitive activities involving signals, intelligence, and, and computer network uh, operations. And it wasn't until around 2019 when I started to prepare to retire that unfortunately we had two service members died by suicide at the organization that I was in one month apart. And we all looked at it from the lens of, wow, this has got to be because of post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I tend to not to use a disorder word, see it more as of an injury, traumatic brain injury, or just the life of being in the military for such a long time. And that, that really took a toll on me in 2019 as I prepared to retire um, and had to get, kind of come to a Jesus with my medical and outline uh, what I had gone through so I can process out of the military. And so really quick, a lot of that was, you know, the, the, that, the typical toll of war, the, the, the bangs and bruises and, and what comes with it. And as I retired, I was fortunate enough to go to the National Intrepid Center of Excellence for Traumatic Brain Injury. And there they look at you holistically for a month and try to kind of figure out, you know, what, what my life was as a special operator and an, and an intelligence professional. And for me, the most important thing of going in there wasn't only the muscular skeletal pain. It wasn't, you know, dealing with the, the stresses of war or the moral injuries. It was, Hey, I'm, I'm having cognitive issues. I don't, I don't remember things like I used to remember. I'm starting to forget languages. Uh, dear God, I can't even get behind a command line anymore and, and, and do any of the basic work that I did uh, as an offensive cyber operator. Um, and, and that was important to me. And fortunately, I was able to go um, through the medical program and they taught me a lot about what traumatic brain injuries and concussions can do to your cognition and ways to make you better, right? So through sleep therapy and a variety of, uh, you know, just also talk therapy and, and, and certain medicines and things that they did help me. And I, and I felt that I had then a better future as far as my brain went, as far as my ability to just to continue as a high performer to leave the military and, and, and provide a successful life for me. And as I reflected back on that, I'm like, well, how about all my, all my colleagues and all the individuals and professionals um, that I've worked with, where, where, are, they, where are they at um, in that sort of realization that the level of work that we did took a toll on us? And I need that high assurance, that high technical work that I believe it's not really identified um, with some of the tolls of, of war. And so as I started to retire and worked with a lot of nonprofit organizations and medical organizations um, in specific to mental health um, and into traumatic brain injuries. And, and, and my goal again was how do I make my brain better? How do I get back to being that, that individual? And so with that, I read a couple of papers and met a couple of folks, and and one of them that was uh, really key and impactful was a document called Operator Syndrome. And Operator Syndrome was written by Dr. Free, um, of whom I've had the pleasure to be able to talk to throughout the last couple of years. And what he simply did was to be able to put together this constellation, if you would, of everything that it is the life of someone um, that goes through special operations and these high assurance work. And I was like, wow, that is so powerful. That is just the ability for me to be able to understand what's been impacting my life uh, and those of my friends. And in addition to being able to share this with my family and go, look, this is, this is what I, I've been through. And so I, as I looked at that and I started to get better and realizing what, what was taking a toll on my life, I reached a point because of loving education and constantly wanting to learn more, so you know, I think it. I think it's time for me to go ahead and pursue a PhD. And I didn't know in what I wanted to do it in. I knew I wanted to do it online, and I knew I wanted to be able to also be able to um, to uh, solve a problem. And that problem was what I looked at in the mirror, right? And that was what I had gone through. And I happened to stumble upon, you know, cyber psychology because it's here at the Capital Tech University. And I said, wow, that's that's kind of fascinating. I, I, I love the psychology part of it. Actually, I didn't. Uh, I kind of lied there. 
um, because we spent a lot of our time in special operations talking to our psychologists that were constantly monitoring us and making sure that we were fit for the type of work that we were consistently being put at. And obviously, I loved the cyber side because I spent many years doing cyber work and high technology type work. And when I looked into it and the meaning of cyber psychology, just essentially, right, the intersection of human behavior and technology, and I was like, wow, that's that's pretty thoughtful. I've always understood what it meant to be an infantryman in the Marine Corps. I understood what it meant to be a special operator, how to do intelligence work. I understood that that whole mindset. What I didn't quite really understand was what was it really to be an offensive cyber operator, just to say in the military or an intelligence a- agency that's actually waging sort of a cyber war, if you would, or conducting intelligence operations through a keyboard, a monitor, and using a mouse. What, what does that really mean uh, as far as in our minds and, and, and our understanding of, of what that is and, and our leaders? Because there's a lot of issues that we encountered um, with leaders just not understanding what, what a cyber operator did. And so this is where I'm at today with my PhD, and it's you know, it's kind of a a life goal right now. I I get to give back, if you would, and sort of chip away at this. And so with that, my research is in operational cyber psychology, and it's in support to offensive cyber operations. And I chose offensive cyber operations because a lot of the literature and a lot of what we see today, and many of the professionals are involved in it, is the defensive side. But very little is actually kind of known of what it is in the world of being an offensive cyber operator. And so during my literature review, I was very fortunate to find very key papers that were eye-opening to me personally, um, but also helped me navigate where I'm at today. And so, you know, a few of them really quickly were one that was actually written by Dr. Dijkstra from, from NSA, and he was able to do a survey and put on paper what, what it meant to be uh, a offensive cyber operator, if you would, the, the cognitive load, the fatigue, and the failure. And so just in those three things, I, was, I can associate with that where I'd never had necessarily on sort of the soldier marine side of the house. I never really looked at what those impacts were. I was like, wow, that's, that's really powerful. And then I found another couple of studies from, um, from the Air Force. And they were also then studying early in 2013 and 2018 the, uh, the the similar occupational burnout, the stress, and the, all the way to suicide ideation that was associated with what they they termed their remote operators, uh, the remote warrior, excuse me, that included cyber operators and drone operators and some of their intelligence. So, wow, that's that's powerful. Actually, one of those papers. Uh, put me in tears because uh, as I read it and, and I was able to associate with all the symptoms, with what their research, what it was leading to. And I, w- I was never able to really understand that while I did all this highly technical work. I understood the muscular skeletal pain that I was suffering from and the, and the sleep generally associated, but not how it had been impacting m- my brain, if you would, my cognition, my, my ability to continue to engage um, and highly technical work, and, and, and for that matter, even in, in languages. And then there was a couple of other ones that were interesting were, were from a foreign perspective. And I've always been sort of, because of the languages uh, that, I, that I've had to learn in the military, I always on, took on a sort of a different my, uh, perspective culturally just to be able to understand where I needed to operate. Um, and that played well as I started to read um, several papers, and I, I believe some of the authors are, uh, may actually be on this meeting, and part of this group, and and they were also able to describe, um, you know, some key aspects of of being in cyber operation. Like, wow, this is this is really powerful. So I started to put it all together and looked at then creating a very similar operator syndrome, right? And because the operator syndrome construct that Dr. Free and Dr. Fowler wrote was, you know, thirteen key. Symptoms, but I was able. We, when I say we, uh, a lot of the special operations community and, and others have been able to relate that to go. Hey, that's exactly what I have. I have thirteen of those symptoms described as you know the the high allostatic work of being in special operations. And I said, well, how about if we create something very similar? And this is as I did my literature review and sort of my my mapping. Um, these are constant terms that continue to come up, and so that's kind of where I'm at today, which is continuing to conceptualize 
cyberspace operator syndrome with all the research. And then the second part of sort of where I am at today is looking at cyber psychology and operational cyber psychology. So Dr. Spitliata, Marine Reserve psychologist and researcher at John Hopkins, he also put out a fascinating paper with two key points that I took away. With it. He said, first one was, hey, what do, why don't we look at how we assess and select our special operators? Because uh, there's key attributes uh, psychologically and, and physically, if you would, that uh, special operators possess that have uh, allow them to navigate sort of the ambiguity and the toughness of the world that they get thrown into. How about if we look at maybe a way that we assess, recruit, you know, maintain uh, and uh, employ our cyber operators with a very similar framework? But okay, I can relate to that. I actually went through that, and, and I know that that's actually helped me persevere in a lot of the, the work that I had to do, again, in, in cyber operations from a from a remote perspective, sitting in a building somewhere to running around uh, in a combat zone, actually executing cyberspace operations. And so then he also said, hey, how about a, how about a framework of operational cyber psychology, where we have psychologists or support services that truly understand what it is when an offensive cyber operator or a cyber operator for that term are actually engaging in these operations through the internet. What does it actually mean to you know, have a keyboard at the tip of your fingers and transcend, if you would, through through this monitor, through these command lines, you know, through the internet and and um, conduct these activities, which some of them are impacting at a humanistic level the the operator at the other end. They're also suffering from post traumatic stress. They're suffering from moral injury. They're suffering from a variety of other conditions that are associated to to conducting war at the physical level. And so that's where I'm at right now and, you know, joining uh, amazing organizations like yours and, and the many folks that I, I am now able outside of the military just to pick up the phone or send an email and say, hey, I, I love your research. Uh, how do we collaborate so we can we can get to a good state here? Um, so for the most part, that's actually sort of the nutshell of, of where I'm at in, in my research and what I'm trying to accomplish. You know, that's a, that's a great question because that's actually, you know, that, that's a key component of this is you know, some of it is hey, how, how do we make um, our operators more cognitively resilient to to what they have to do? The first thing is, I think it's really, un, it, for me, um, it's understanding what we're putting them through. What, why do they burn out? Why is this so difficult? And in simple form, right, and this is without getting too, too deep into it, is what what is that man or woman actually going through when they're behind that keyboard? What is causing them stress? Because I think, I believe it's also understanding the stress um, that goes along with, with doing this, this type of work. Uh, you know, some of it uh, associates to um, not wanting to be the guy who, or girl who loses, you know, a million dollar exploit. But what does that, what does that mean? I know what it is in, in sort of the physical world of not wanting to shoot someone by accident or not wanting to you know, provide false intelligence. Um, and so really understanding what does it mean when you first go through becoming a cyber operator? And I'll tell you, one of the things that I consistently hear is essentially the same thing is I don't want to forget. I have so much that I have to, I have to remember. I have so many skills that I have to continuously uh, stay up on, right? In the world of cyber, it's just not as, as many of you know, it's just not as simple as a one-for-one reaction, like, you know, M4, shoot target, grenade, throw grenade over, right? There's tasks and there's tasks and conditions that military folks are taught. Well, when you go into cyber world, I believe at least right now on the cognitive resilience piece is A, it's understanding what they have to do truly. What are the pressures that they are under, right? Um, and just the level of pressure from, you know, self-reflecting in the and, and the communities that I have spoken to, it's it's unfortunately, breaking these folks down at the human level. And many of them that come in the military, they're assessed and selected to be a cyber operator. It's not like we took infantrymen or intelligence officers and then we we, we made them cyber operators because they were assessed to be able to have the attributes to deal with some of this ambiguity, if you would, in, in the intelligence world. So the, you know, there's a lot of really good, um, actually it's on my, my chart here, there's a lot of really good documentation on, on that uh, sort of resiliency. Um, I, I would submit that it's first truly understanding 
um, what their roles are, what the stresses are. There's some occupational issues. Um, a lot of them were like, well, hey, my command doesn't understand what I do. I have to learn all of this highly technical work, but then I also have to go do this basic soldiering stuff, which um, you know, you, you only have so much bandwidth in your mind, right? And that's how I look at it. It's like now I look back at everything that I had to remember or, or be accountable for. I'm like, I don't know how I did that. Well, I can I can tell that I things were coming off the plate. So for that cognitive validity, I think we just need to, you know, there's a lot of performance, reduce a lot of that risk and really just understand. And it, what I'm actually trying to do now is, is paint that picture of what it really means to be uh, a cyber operator, you know, and then so we can look at it from that perspective. And I do come from at least being, and, I, and I'm very careful about it, of going, I did that as an operator, but now I'm also looking at it. Well, now I'm a researcher, so I have to be, you know, aware of of that. But it is um, something that is key. Yeah, I, I have seen it because uh, I've opened a wide cast, right? Because I, I try to learn. I mean, I'm even doing comparative analysis with with the life of a drone operator. Right. Mm-hmm. And and even interesting to to NASCAR drivers of, of what it is to be a, a NASCAR, you know, race driver inside of these in these uh, these vehicles. Uh, I, I think the more that I've looked at from technology, at least for, for this type of work, have been a how t- certain technologies are being designed uh, from very smart engineers. But maybe they didn't think about the humanistic side of of that mm-hmm. operator who has to use it. Right. Or, hey, you're making one more technology that's being put in a toolkit for an operator. Maybe we're not looking at that holistically and the impact of that individual who has to use that technology. I have looked at it just because of, of some of the work that, that I've, I've done on the technology um, that's used for, to your point, to, to cybersecurity and maybe some of the difficulties in, in those that um, develop the tools for the cyber operators. But beyond that, no, not not intensively. If not, I would go down those rabbit holes because I love I love technology and I love developing technology, but I haven't looked at it from from that framework. So thank you. I, I do, absolutely. Um, you know, and I, and I kind of the first thing is I built around it, you know, and I say, hey, you know, we're we're still essentially hacking through a keyboard and a mouse and a monitor, right? Yeah. With, with, with everything we're seeing. So I'm actually looking at you know, and, I, and sorry for the military terms, I'm still looking at the fighting hall. I'm still looking at the way we've been doing it and going, it's just the most efficient way, you know, to, to hack the world, if you would, because as you look at sort of cyber doctrine and where we want to go, we want to hack satellites, we want to hack tanks, we want to hack, you know, hack, you know, uh, pacemakers and everything, but we're still doing it through the same sort of framework that we have we had since, A, we probably designed the computers and the internet that the operators are using it. And so I, I am looking at the first one is sort of um, on the medical side is the, the physiology behind doing cyber operations. I've been you know connected to heart rate monitors and things in my brain as a special operators. You know that the special operations command is focused on what's called the hyper enabled operator. And so there's a requirement from SOCOM that they not only want to make their 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 operators run, shoot, move faster, but they also are now looking at the cognition side. And so what I want to do is be able, to, based on some research and some gaps, some recommendations have been, hey, we need to look at the physiological side. What does it actually mean? You know, one of them is HVR. What is my HVR? And I've done that in certain studies. While I was on active duty, they would, you know, essentially put the HVR monitors on us and, and other different technologies to monitor our hearts, right, mostly um, while we were doing certain activities. I'd like to be able to look, and there's some of the, the research from uh, other folks who are, are looking at the brain process, right, that, that while you're doing that type of work, to be able to identify, wow, that operator just hit a wall. He is, you know, he's, he's low on energy, his, his brain cognition-wise, if you would, he's out of bandwidth, uh, and he's about to make a mistake, right? And that's the key for some of this technology. So, A, how do I look at physiologically while someone is, is on the keyboard? And more importantly, before they're on the keyboard and after, that's the operator's home life. What you know, what 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 do they get any sleep? One of the recurring issues, and I don't think uh, from what I've searched, I definitely know in certain other fields in special, we're monitoring sleep apnea because that's a condition that's that it, it's impacting us heavily, and they're trying to make these operators. Uh, you know, we're monitoring them at night. I don't think we're doing that right now. In the cyber world, and I, and I say that broadly because there's all the different services, you know, at least in the U.S. and in the intelligence organization. So I am looking at 
the physiology behind some of these impacts and, and, and how is that attributing to, to their cognition. Second would be then visualization. How do we get to use AR, VR, right, to make it easier so I can better visualize going through my keyboard and my monitor through the internet, right, through my wireless access point, through a router, navigating the internet, and then hitting this adversary's building. How do I visualize that so I'm not only looking at a command line anymore because that's really visually intensive, right, to something that you said. If I can have a street map, a Waze app in the cyber world, that would definitely reduce some of the the, the tolls uh, on my mind. And so that's one of the things that I'm looking at. And then simply not to get too much into the AI, hey, how do I have, you know, a human machine or human AI teaming to help me make better decisions, right? An assistant, a virtual assistant can help me, hey, I'm, I'm at this problem, what tool do I use? Or what command do I use versus me trying to go back and recall that? Well, why don't I use an assistant, you know, an artificial intelligence that can actually help me navigate? And I'm still the human who presses enter, right? That's the key different thing. So that would be two. Three is communications. A lot of it has been written about, um, you know, the lack of communication between the actual operator and maybe the collection manager or the uh, exploitation analyst that's giving him, well, if that analyst isn't really understanding what I'm seeing, you know, they can see my monitor, but they're not really understanding what I'm going through. So how do we improve that communications? And, and so it's been talked about like, uh, you know, cognition, team cognition and understanding what, what they're doing. And then to the command group, right? The command group who's sometimes, unfortunately, having to stop these operators midway through their operations so they can get authorities, well, that communicate, you know, that guy is still a girl. Their brains are still revving. They're still hyper focused. They're they're experiencing um, hyper vigilance because they don't know if they're going to get caught. Or now the cybersecurity professional at the other end is potentially seeing them on their system while they're waiting for communications. Right. So communications, in, in at least in military, is key. We have to be able to communicate sort of at, at that speed. Um, so those are the three technologies that I am definitely looking at, and I am trying to incorporate that now in, into my studies. Um, and then, sorry, there was one more. And then visualization goes back to the tools. Right now, everything is command line. How do I not use the world of these apps, right, that it can simplify the work that I'm doing? And some of that is in certain ways that organizations, for security reasons, have to use, you know, simpler tools. Um, but I think these simple tools, again, when we go back, we're like, hey, this has been way too many years of still using these, you know, these simple tools. We need to work backwards, I believe, from the human operator and build these technologies to make them much more efficient. Um, I love this topic because, again, this goes to that humanistic side of the person behind the keyboard, right? Everybody thinks, and when you read, it's like, hey, cyber warfare and cyber tools and cyber weapons and fire for effect and all of these terms. And at the end, we forget that poor man and woman that are behind. And even and even to, to a point, the, the exploitation analyst that, or, or mission commander, whoever, that gave the order or gave the concept to go, to go do something. And so for me um, and how I've had to reflect on it is – a lot of the work, so when I left the military, let me work backwards, you know, um, they're like, hey, you have post-traumatic stress. And this was based in 2019. Before that, for 20-something uh, years, um, at least of operating at the special operations level, I had no idea I had post-traumatic stress. Like, I'll tell everybody in the world, now I have post-traumatic stress. It's not a disorder. It was an injury. And I am way better because I've actually worked through each of the um things in my life that cause the trigger, right? So in post-traumatic stress, they always look at what the triggers are so you can work backwards from them, right? So I had several of them from the typical post-traumatic stress of, uh, I don't want to be in crowded rooms, noises, you know, loud noises and flying in an airplane, right? So, but I've been able to work backwards from those and get therapy and understand how they impact. I mean, a lot of it was just talking about, it. hey, I didn't know I had a fear of flying because a lot of the planes that I was in almost fell, fell out of the sky or me jumping out of airplanes. A lot of times my parachute didn't open or I hit the, I hit the ground hard, right? And then, so I took all of that post-traumatic stress and then acknowledged it, worked through it. And then I'm actually a much more powerful person because I've been through adversity. I know what it is to have stress in my life or have these questionable feelings about X. And I'm like, okay, I'm good. Like, so there's very little... 
if you would, that's in a closet somewhere that I have to work about emotionally. However, as I started to also, you know, my journey coming out was the the, the hard skills, typical infantry men, and then it was the softer, technical, you know, cyber world, which is what we're we're discussing here. So on the on on the moral injury side, absolutely, I've had to deal with the moral injury side of being the person that has shot back at folks trying to kill me, and I've had to kill them, or I have actually relayed intelligence. Um, that has actually then caused an impact. Like if someone has gotten captured or someone's gotten killed or worse, you know, then bombs have been dropped uh, on an objective because of something that I figured out or, or as a team, we provided intelligence. And then, you know, and so those were the hard ones to process because those are actually even harder to talk about. It's easier to talk about, hey, I got shot at, I shot at somebody. How do you say, how do you process from an intelligence in the cyber world that I led to the capture, I led to the death of someone? That's huge. That still needs to be discussed in what it is. And so then now there's also this moral piece of how about the guy that I just broke into their network or we did this, uh, we did this activity and the poor cybersecurity person at the other end who, who their job is to defend their networks. Well, it's my job to get in their network, right? So we're kind of fighting each other, if you would, in this cyber domain. And now there is a known breach, right? So intelligence from their organization was stolen or I don't know, a nuclear reactor spun out of control, whatever, right? Someone's going to get blamed. Well, now as an operator, I have to think about, oh, crap, what did, a, what did I do that potentially put that person at risk? Or their livelihood. Maybe it wasn't as dramatic as I just painted it. Maybe it was just, you know, a small, you know, cyber a company somewhere or organization. Um, but that person now loses their livelihood. This is something that we have to think about. And in many times, and this is where I, I kind of like the operational cyber psychology aspect, which is having support services that truly understand what that team's about to do. Hey, you're about to hack into, you know, this tank or, or this thing that can harm someone that they can get caught. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about what that impact is. Similarly to what we do in the combat arms side of the house, where we know that an infantryman is going to go in contact and they're going to battle someone. But how about in this cyber warfare construct, we also start understanding the moral, you know, the moral injury side and get ahead of it, right? And be able to talk about it. And so some of that is pre-operations, post-operations, talking about it, because that is now what is being done, in the, at least in the special operations community, to deal with some of this moral injury. It's like, hey, man, we just got into a gunfight and you killed a bunch of people. Let's talk about this before later on you're dealing with a post-traumatic stress disorder, right, stigma. Well, let's get away from it. It is just part of it is the unfortunate sides of what we do, uh, but we got to take care of that human. And what does it mean to be human? So we can grow from that and actually do our jobs much better. Um, you know, just being really good at us, being a cybersecurity professional, defensive or offensive cyber operator. That's that's, I think that's only part of the uh, equation of what really matters. You know, um, some of the research has indicated, um, you know, when, when they've done the selection that it's Hey, that's great that you got really smart people. You know, uh, I think the military kind of failed a little bit at this. They got really, really smart folks. They brought them in because they would meet the definition of maybe what a defensive or offensive cyber operator is. And then they put them through these long courses, which unfortunately, I think you you probably are aware of the numbers. It's, you know, the percentages to get these individuals that come through, it's at 30 or 40 percent. Uh, so there's something there, right? And the military is never perfect. We're, we're constantly trying to, you know, fix the foxhole and make everything better if you would. So I think there's a piece of it, A, first, how do we assess and select the people that come in here to have some of these tools, the resiliency, the emotional intelligence, right? A baseline that right. can help them, A, understand, which is what, you know, what I spoke about earlier, of what we're going to really put them through. And it isn't just hacking and learning Python and, and SQL and, and no, that's the least, you know, so being a hacker is, you know, in the sense of a, a hacker that's not doing this for a purpose, right? Not for motivation mm -hmm. or money or for the kicks of it. There are a lot of rules in the military and then in the intelligence community of what we're going to take that same mindset of a hacker um, and then we're going to professionalize them and we're going to put them into this industry. Now, I submit that the military is still learning how to do cyber, right? The intelligence organizations 
I think are much better the time that I've spent in them because there's a lot of rules, but they, when they bring in the civilians, they're training them and they're teaching them a certain where they're assessing and selecting them. And then they're, they're teaching them how to think a certain way, communicate a certain way, and then use certain tools. And there's less ambiguity, I would submit, in the intelligence community than there is in the military because of the authorities. Yes, you you can do this. You can't do this. You can use this tool. You can't be in on that infrastructure. Jesus, that's so complicated, right? It already just stresses you out, just understanding what it, what it takes to be on that keyboard that day. And so what do we do? I submit it's really based on the literature um, you know, there's a lot of things written on cyber defense and cybersecurity. So if I looked at it from a cybersecurity lens, and I had to be very careful because I then stopped using cybersecurity in a lot of my searches, right? Because I would get the entire world that focused on cybersecurity. So my bachelor's and my master's are in cybersecurity. And no offense to anyone, I don't like doing cybersecurity because it's, it's actually very complex. You have to kind of want to be in that defensive role, right? Or you want to be in that cybersecurity sort of uh, arena versus the world that I, you know, that we're kind of in. It's that supporting national security, right? And there's a there's a difference to that. And so, uh, you know, regardless if you're defensive or offensive or defensive, at least in this point, there are some things. It is understanding what these folks have to do, and and there is literature. The Air Force has actually been really good from the data that I have found. You know, again, unclassified. Uh, the Air Force has been really good because they looked at it from the same lens, and this is the lens that I'm taking on the pilot. The pilot is, you know, very important to the Air Force, right? So there's a lot of physiology, psychology, and even the human factoring design of making that airplane, you know, kind of revolves around backwards, if you would, to that pilot. And I think we need to kind of do some some very similar, you know, on on where are we building the tools and the infrastructure for offensive and cyber operations. There's, you know, yes, there is a little bit of, of, of differences there. So in the literature, you know, there is a large um, piece of it. It's all that cognitive overload, right? That cognitive workload. Okay, well, how do we start reducing that? If it's been, you know, on both sides, on the cybersecurity and defensive, how do we start reducing that cognitive load on, on that operator? Is, is some of it coming because they're having to, to wait in the queue to be able to, you know, ef- efficiently communicate to the you know exploitation analyst what they're seeing and then they need from communications what do they do next are they not sharing the same visual picture right similar to maybe how drone operators if you look at that today drone operators have done some uh, critical work right they've had to you know press or fire that little red button that has had in a kinetic impact and so before all of that happened whatever happens in that little trailer in, in Nevada, has had to be very precise because of the end state. I think we need to look at some of that similar infrastructure that's used in drone operations, uh, potentially in, 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 the cyber, in the cyber world because of just the effect of it. You know, some of the key things that came from the research was, you know, cognitive overload and fatigue, large burnout. And it isn't just burnout that's associated with, hey, some of these operators want to leave the military because they want to go make money in the private industry. I just also did a stint in the private industry doing kind of boutique cyber threat intelligence with former operators and analysts. And, and you know, they, they, they didn't leave the military because of, of wanting to get more money. They were just burnt out. And they were burnt out by the way that sort of the military and the government housed the way that they did work. And they wanted to go somewhere else that gave them a little bit more flexibility. So there's also some aspects of sort of that occupational burnout and then just the burnout of having trying to do that work in those communities and in those uh, restrictions that come from doing it uh, within the military. You know, there's post-traumatic sort of stress that comes with it. There's ethical and moral distress in the type of work that we did. What did it really mean ethically to be a operator, right? If you would, in the IC or, or in the government, what, what does that mean? What am I dealing with, right? So that needs to be looked at. And then it's everything that happens on the physiological side. I don't, there hasn't been a lot of research that I have found on, you know, not only a, is the desk ergonomically correct, but there are issues, the sleep issues. There is, you know, the, the, some of the stuff that I've looked at on the eyes, right? Are, are we really figuring out how to make the proper eyeglasses that help, you know, these poor people that are sitting behind these monitors for eight and 10 hours? Well, there's eye strain that, you know, on the medical side, 
um, you know, that eye strain can cause fatigue. And well, how do we start eliminating that in, in, in some of sort of the infrastructure? So sometimes I got to put on my, you know, my just the basic hat of a of a leader that was in the military and looking after my folks and going, how do I how do I enable some of this research back at that kind of leadership to make their jobs easier? And then also reflecting on my time doing it, but then looking into the future and then, you know, uh, and additionally being able to reach out to all you researchers and go, Hey, what do you think? Help me, help me solve this problem or help me at least take the ball forward a little bit. So on the stress, I've, I've, you know, the post-traumatic stress as a whole, um, I think I've discussed it a little bit and and sort of just been um, vulnerable, uh, you know, expressing, Hey, I've, I've had it and I've worked through it and I'm aware of what it is as I continue to um, engage in sort of my research and reflect and, and talk to other uh, operators and folks um, that are doing this work. And, 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 and additionally, I also come in from the, from the side that I do a lot of veteran advocacy. So I do support openly um, with mental health, suicide prevention, um, and then looking at, at, at how as a, as a whole, if we would, we're, we're attacking uh, post-traumatic stress, um, traumatic brain injury, if you would, moral injuries, and then, um, some of the different tools that are, are being out there. And so on, on the growth, um, not to get into, you know, I literally just, it just evaded me that, you know, the, the, the meaning of, of the growth piece, but how I've, 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 I've taken it is, is simply just growing from it, the, the accept. That was the, the, the first thing, um, which was the hardest thing in, in my house really quick was when I had my two friends die by suicide and they were one month apart. It was being able to acknowledge that I had post-traumatic stress, that, you know, all of these years of doing this, uh, what it actually was, and then breaking them down into what was causing me post-traumatic stress, right? Like what were the triggers? And that's generally what's, I think, easier associated with not just saying, yeah, I have post-traumatic stress, but what is it that's actually triggering it? And then what are you doing to get over it or A, to understand it? Um, and then how are you working towards I don't know, conquering it? That's that kind of growth, right? Again, as I mentioned, like I had fears of flying an airplane because of all the times I thought I was going to crash or I thought something was going was to happen. Uh, so just understanding, understanding those. And so the growth pieces for me right now, when I talk to folks about, you know, um, uh, a acknowledging post-traumatic stress and then growing from it uh, is that acknowledgement and then being able to talk um, um, and work through it. And some of it is not only individually, it may sometimes be with the folks that you're around. That's very powerful to, you know, we don't want to keep these types of secrets from our family and our friends because they're constantly around you. So I think once you you're open with them, this kind of facilitates this ability to, to grow past um, what's, what's bringing you down, what's causing, you know, the depressions, that anger, um, it changes your hormones, it changes your sleep, you get into substance abuse, and you can get into this very poor behavior. And so once you're acknowledging that, and you're working on it, I see that as the growth piece. Um, and just uh, acknowledging just like an injury, right? I, I always equate post-traumatic stress more to an injury, Hey, I sprained my ankle. Okay, that doesn't mean I'm going to get kicked out of the military. That means I just got to heal that ankle, and then I've got to be aware that I don't do activities again that are going to hurt that that knee. The same thing with post traumatic. I think same similar thing with post traumatic. I think just growing from it. My my chair, um, as many of you know, and probably you, many of you are, you know, it stopped me at my first roadblock when I'm preparing my IRB and kind of laying out what I want to try to survey in my interviews to gather my data. And the first one was, uh, what, what is your definition of an operator? What, what, who are you trying to focus on? Um, you know, I knew just for time, I, I would have to focus on those that did um, offensive cyber operations versus defensive, even though um, very similar training, but I needed to focus on those that are dealing with the impacts, the adverse impacts of doing the offensive side. <laughs> Um, and so it was cataloging who they are in the, at least in the U S military, you know, in the five or four different branches that are doing it is figuring out who in the army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, Coast Guard is actually doing offensive cyber operators. So I can, I can do my demographic and let people go, yes, I'm one of those. Um, and then in the U S military, then we also have the, the others, right? The special operations community of individuals who've been trained to a certain level, um, to be able to act. So I had to figure out 
who my operators are going to be so I can capture enough data. And then how long of data am I going to capture? Am I going to go any back five years or do I go back 20 years to just right before 2000 when we started September 11th? Because there is a lot um, in the early on aspects of, of the global war on terrorism with cyberspace operations that today I don't think is very similar, but we have a lot of operators from before that had to go into some of these servers and, and pull down beheading videos. You know, and we had to, they had to go and we as a team were looking for hostages um, that we were trying to leverage cyber to find where they're at. And we had to find some of these horrible things or, or the, or the methodologies that we used. So we had to go essentially into the dark web, find really nasty material in order to be able to use that against our adversaries in, in, in a variety of different techniques. And so finding the operators and talking to them, what I have seen that I'm trying to really leverage is because I'm one of them. I'm the guy who says, Hey, I, I've done this. I'm, you know, I, I'm not only a researcher. I don't only have, I have degrees in cybersecurity. I, I have certified in doing cyber. I'm certified operator. I've been shot at. I, I, I've lost sleep. I've gone to the doctor because um, of, you know, of the cognition and I wanted to make my brain better and got in all the scans. And so I come from it as one of them. You know, and, and that's also what I looked at at the research. Who else who has, I don't want to say the credentials, more of the street creds can talk to an operator. And the strength that we have seen in the veteran community is that, you know, a, a, a veteran can easily talk to another veteran, right? Because we can relate. And so what I have seen is right now, the, the operators that I have spoken to, and many of them are my friends, and it is just at that grassroot levels, hey, what, what are you feeling? Or here's what I'm feeling, right? So sometimes it's not, you're not even asking. I'm just, I'm just sharing with you and people have contacted me going, man, what you just said is exactly what I'm feeling and I didn't know how to do it. So reaching the population right now, um, uh, uh, I am trying to do it where uh, I, it, let me back up one step. So the, in order to do that uh, and to fund my PhD, I, I went ahead and applied to the National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship, right? So in, in, in the military, you learn to do whatever you got to do to get to the next step. And that for me was, let me get some validity, let somebody certify that what I'm doing uh, is meaningful rather than just Eric at Cap Tech University studying cyber psychology, right? Like, okay. Uh, but in order to be able to get some ground, I went and got and applied for this fellowship and I was awarded. It's like a 1.9 um, acceptance rate or whatever, whatever it is. And so that means that the Department of Defense Army Research Office said, hey, what Eric just put in his research plan about studying the human, the cognitive piece, and the, you know, the psychological and physiological, we're going to pay for his PhD. So this has actually given me then some room to go back to organizations and go, hey, I don't know how we're going to do this, uh, but I'd like to talk to you, NSA. I'd love to talk to you, Marine Cyber, Army Cyber, or the leaders that I've worked with. They're now coming, you know, they're, they're, they're um, acknowledging what I'm doing, and they're wanting to talk. So I'm hoping that this momentum continues and that I can reach that, that uh, cast that net because I am one of them and because I do come showing my vulnerabilities and I'm looking at it at the humanistic uh, perspective. So that's a, a very good point. And then, you know, the gamification, I have, I have looked in that into what the video game. Interestingly, I don't know if I'm going to get the authorities to do it, but I have a 17-year-old who plays video games upstairs. So I am looking forward to strapping him on some, some HDR and heart rate monitors to see what he goes through games. But that is th definitely something uh, that, that I am researching. Is there something within that world of games and how games are created and, and how someone in this you know, trillion dollar industry figured out how to make these video games um, you know, work and, 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 hook our, you know, and hook our gamers onto it? How do we take some of those internals that they learned and maybe apply this to not only the offensive cyber uh, operations, but maybe into the cybersecurity world. The, the compartmentalization, that was actually, uh, that's, uh, that's close to home for me because that's actually what I suffered in um, mostly in the 20, 20, last 23 years within special operations. Um, and towards the end when, again, there's some stuff that I've done in, in other podcasts uh, discussing sort of the, the, my journey, my experiences in, in, in special operations, you know, and, I, and I've just really quick, I, I've called it, you know, the, the opening of Pandora's box, right? Because that's what happened to me at 2019 and what triggered it the most traumatic thing wasn't what I experienced forward in combat, um, you know, everything I dealt with, with, with that, if you would, 
but it was then when I lost uh, two guys to suicide, which was a reflective point. Why them? They're just like me. They were recruited just like me. They were selected. I helped train them, you know, I deployed with them. Um, and then why, why did they lose hope? Right. And, and do what they, you know, unfortunately you know, die by suicide. And so when I went and, you know, dropped to my knees and, and had to go get help, the poor psychologist and the folks that had to talk to me, they realized that I had actually compartmentalized all of these aspects of my life because for me, and it was very, it's kind of very similar to maybe what cyberspace operators are doing or, or in this community is they'll be focused on a mission, a, a type of mindset of what they have to do and the secrecy behind it and the complexities behind it for maybe a week, two weeks, three weeks, depending the operation. And then they're, they're being pulled because they're an expert on something or they're a team and then they got to do another task. And they may not they, they may not be decompressing from that. And then they're like, okay, well, nobody's talked to me about it. You know, uh, I'm too tired. I'm too busy. I'm going to box it up in, you know, in a little envelope. And I'm going to put it back in, inside the skip, the secure facility, in the safe in there. And then, and then I'll leave it there. And I'll tell you that that's very dangerous because that's essentially what's happened to a lot of us is we just compartmentalize it in a bad way. That's not the compartmentalization that we were taught to do that when I leave home, I leave home here and when I go forward to operate, I have to have my mind in the game and I've got to, you know, sort of assume that identity and bring in all the skills that I've learned uh, to operate efficiently. So I make sure that I don't, you know, that I take care of the men and the women to my left and to the right and I don't compromise the mission. And then I come home and attempt to reintegrate into my family. But this type of work, compartmentalizing it um, just because maybe we don't have the support services that truly understand, again, and this goes back to my point that the support services truly understand what, at least in this, in this regards that the, the, the cyberspace operators are truly going through and then just being able to uh, confront it, put it on the table, deal with it, grow from it or put strategies in it to grow. And then more importantly, learn, you know, continue to identify what they're going to go into and are they prepared to go through that right mentally, if you would psychologically, and then how are they physically in this in their sleep and, and, and all of these other things that you know, we forget about that. What happened to that operator when we, when he went home, did he go open up a, you know, did he go open up a beer and get drunk because he can't shut down his brain? And we've never identified that he has sleep apnea, that he has, you know, sleep disturbances, that he has, you know, there's marital problems. And so that's a, you know, that's a, a whole different thing, but yeah, a caution against just hiding it and shoving it down. I think we need to confront it, but sometimes there is a form of compartmentalization, or sort of putting it on the side so you can focus, right? And those goes in, into some of those cognitive resiliences and focus and being able to do your job, have the bandwidth in your brain to do your job and then back out of it, decompress, and then, you know, and reset, right, if you would, and kind of grow from that. The first thing that I, I actually do, and it's interesting because I got to get the feedback here next week, is post-service, you know, just really quick, you know, a, a large part of what I thought was, facilitating me for getting the honey to do list. So my wife says, Hey, go, go to Walmart and go buy these things. And I'm like, I'm this highly trained, you know, guy, but I go to Walmart and I completely forgot what I was doing. I can tell you, you know, where the security mm -hmm. guards were, the, the doors, the cameras. And I'm like, I do not remember why that. Oh, mm -hmm. but I came to Walmart. And so I went back and looked and go, Hey, is this because of all the bangs and bruises and getting hit by an RPG and, you know, landing on my head on jumps? They're like, yeah, that has a piece to it to do. And again, this is where I've kind of focused on this study. But as I related to them, I'm like, hey, I also did really highly technical work and languages, mm -hmm. right, that stays in there. And some of it is also, you know, and I've talked to a couple of operators, and this is the most shocking thing that I've heard is cyber operators telling me, we don't have enough training. I'm like, oh, my God, if you just read the GAO report, you know, that just recently came out, it's what, fi almost $500,000 to develop one interactive on net operator, right? That's what's needed for, for cyber operators, of which many in the military that have now learned on the conventional side, they'll come in, become a cyber professional, professional, but they're really not yet trained to become an ion to actually be behind the keyboard and do at, at the cybercom or at the at the IC level what's really needed from them. Um, and so you're, you know, and so that's something to to determine, but when I went back and I said, "Okay, hey, I've, I need to work on this memory thing because there's so many, so much stuff post retirement." My purpose was help other veterans, um, you know, and prevent mm -hmm. suicide because that's the one thing that once that happens, I can't fix it. Right? I had been able to solve guys, guys and girls have been able to solve some very complex problems. We have yet to bring back a human 
I find that to be my priority, right? So fix the yeah. human or, uh, you know, fix that. And so uh, I have just recently continued and I went again, as I mentioned, to the National Interpret Center of Excellence for Traumatic Brain Injury. It's a month long program, amazing mm-hmm. program. You know, and they taught me yoga, art therapy, yeah. you know, took out a bunch of blood and TBI and actually taught me how to learn better. And I got tools. And so I submit today, and I've, and I've said this before, that where I'm at today is where I was at almost in 2004, right, in my military career. From 2005 to about 2019, I had so much um, of these, uh, not only physical injuries in the military, but these, I don't know, I'm just going to throw it out there, these cognitive you know, issues and burnout mm-hmm. that I didn't realize were actually degrading my life and my performance, right? So I would go out with purpose and meaning to accomplish my mission, but I really, really wasn't that effective. And I was actually probably dangerous. And many of us were probably operating borderline on instance. And so as we've left the global war on terrorism and we're going into this higher state national security kind of requirements, it's going to take us to reset our people and our Mm -hmm. processes to better study them so they can be efficient. And so the one thing that's helped me save, you know, that helps me is my OR rate. Because I look at it every day. I actually look at the measures that I, so I do mindfulness every morning. I do all of these techniques that I've learned. Actually, when I do my research uh, for about 45 minutes, hour, you know, like deep work, I actually put clip on my HVR. So as mm-hmm. I'm doing the research, I'm actually monitoring dingings and, hey, you're in the green, you're in the green. And there are times that now I'm learning those tools. If I get stuck, I breathe, you know, th- those little tools. Um and then I've also, when I sit down and I'm looking at that, I also go back and monitor my what my sleep was. Because sleep is, to me, the, one of the number one things. And I know it's also the number one thing that when most of these poor you know, cyber operators, if you would, go home, no one's really asking them, nor do they know how that person's sleeping. Unfortunately, many in the military aren't being assessed for sleep apnea until they're getting ready to retire or leave the military. It's not like I just got sleep apnea the day before I decided to leave. (laughs) Why don't we look at, so I'm also looking at at this field. Um, I was also an air crew member. So there's a huge physiological requirements to being in an air crew and, and jumping out of planes in sort of military free fall, right? Like they're very big. Uh, There's certain medical requirements, just like pilots. So we have to have the same physiological uh, exams that pilots. Well, why don't we take some of that, sort of view on our pilot's health and bring it into the cyber space operations. Yeah. Because if you think about it today, the person who hits that inner button on an, an effect that can destroy something six, mm-hmm. you know, 6,000 miles away, it's probably the deadliest weapon we have today is the pressing of that button, I would submit, compared to a missile. So those operators are really stressed when they have to hit that button the biomarkers and, and tracking. I think it's just going back to the humanistic level, which is what I'm trying to look at um, and then work backwards from that. I, I appreciate that. Uh, the two key things I, I took away from it uh, was, you know, what did someone have to do in the duty of their country and then sort of return them, um, return them back to, to their lives and, and, and hopefully in a meaningful manner where they can uh, go into corporate industry in a private sector and um and and have a you know a fruitful life for themselves and their family that's that's how i'm looking at it right what did they what did someone have to do for their country for their democracy um which hopefully today this is the the main reason um we have uh, individuals who come and join the military and they join uh at least our intelligence and our government uh because of that that sense of pride that purpose um which is what why, why why they do it I think a lot of these individuals compartmentalize some of it because maybe uh, from a from a military perspective, they were commanded to do an activity uh, and then they went forward and they did it. And then each of them are dealing with it at a different level. Uh, the one thing that I, at least for me, what I have seen, and I speak on myself from the years that I've been in the military and, and, and retiring as a sergeant major. So someone who is responsible for the many lives of, of, of uh, my soldiers uh, behind me um, was, you know, why did we tell them to do it? They did it. And then today, because of suicides and post-traumatic stress and um, just this cough, this hole that these individuals carry on their back. And unfortunately, they bring it home 
and it impacts their family and their children. We see this just really quickly with our Vietnam era, the children of those that came from Vietnam, right? We haven't yet gone back to those very many that, that, that served in Vietnam, help them um, humanize what they had to do, what they believe ethically and morally was wrong, um, the people that they've lost, right? So they also are dealing with that grief. And then how did that, how did that impact their family and their children uh, into the future? So the undo, I think it is really understand for many that I have helped in the post-traumatic stress world or the moral injury is they had the, there was no framework at the human level to understand what it meant to have to shoot someone that was shooting you. What did it mean to provide information that caused, you know, others to die or others to be imprisoned or, or something really negative to happen. So I think that undoing at least I look at looking at it from the post-traumatic stress lenses is understanding and talk to others, normalize it with others that are potentially there and then, and then grow from it. Um, I believe this is a, a, a huge process that we owe our service members of those that are have served in the government to sort of help them transition with those, and those key things. And it isn't just transition to go get a better job. Because what I've noticed, at least in some other researches, those that leave the military get the first job, they fail, they don't like it, they're unhappy, and they move on to something else and over and over and over because they haven't reset, right? They haven't gone back to understand what happened. Um, and in particular, in some of this, you know, this highly technical work, um, when they're leaving, a lot of them are just burnt out. They don't want to do it anymore. And then they're not finding these companies that have a culture that's accepting them when they're bringing it in. I think that's a, and that's a conversation for another day. It's the culture that some of these organizations embody make a huge difference, um, A, in how it operates, but B, in when you transition people in that you're actually helping those folks um, come into your organization, accept your culture or, or integrate into your culture. And then you're helping that individual then actually become a better person and kind of grow through what they did. I worked for a company that had a lot of former uh, intelligence and cyber people and, and, and together they kind of formed their own tribe and they would talk to each other about what they had gone through. And so they were kind of not undoing it, but they were understanding it. And from that, they were growing and becoming um, just better people. And so the first thing was the motivation, you know, for me really quick at how I painted it, it was another task, another skill that I had to learn and a group of my friends um, and colleagues, excuse me, in early 2004, where as intelligence professionals within the special operations world, you know, and this is again, three years into the global war on terrorism, we were trying to find every way to protect this country, to find, you know, the bad guys, gather the information needed so our decision makers can make the right, uh, the right call, right? So we can gather that intelligence. Uh, it's more than just you know, uh, killing people, having people die, it's they're captured. It's really providing our, so they can make the right policies and decisions. And so um, computer network operations at that time was really fascinating for me because I went from, from signals intelligence, listening to conversations, analysis, understanding various other languages and cultures, understanding technology. How did, how did radials work? How did then cell phones work? How did Wi-Fi work? Um, and how do I, how, how do I intercept that? in order to gain the intelligence that I need. And, and additionally, how do I find the people or the individuals behind those devices, right? So that was already inquisitive. That was something in me that I really enjoyed. Uh, it went along with the purpose of where I work and, and the end state of the type of the information that I needed to provide. And in my organizations, uh, the unique trust that was put in on us from, from special operations, if you simply did that. So when I learned computer network operations, it was a side of me when I was a a young kid, I used to take, you know, I had the Atari 8200s and the computers and the Commodores, which is probably the same story that very many that are in, in cybersecurity can tell. When they were a kid, they had computers and toys, that inquisitive. I used to take them apart. I could never figure out how to put them back together, but it was something that was in me. So when I learned about this computer network operations and, you know, government and military hackers, I'm like, wow, this is really cool. So I took it upon myself as I was being indoctrinated to learn more, right? All of us had stacks and stacks of books because we wanted to, to learn more. So I think it's a very unique branch of the military or organization, especially computer network operations, which is different than flying airplanes, artillery. You know, it's kind of this really weird blend 
Um, but then it's just the task. And so it was something that for me, for me I, I just loved doing. I love to be able, you know, uh, when I trained in the Marine Corps, it was against the Cold War, right? So it was, I'm going to fight this Russian tank, so I'm going to fight this. In cyber op, computer network operations, it's the whole world, right? And when we look at it from the interconnected uh, of the internet, how does the internet really work? How do I really, you know, get onto the computers or devices that have information that can be brought for intelligence? How do I use this to find someone, right? And it goes on and on of the possibilities of what you can do computer network operations. Now, I just described me, 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 which is mostly what most hackers are, right? Or it's themselves always trying to solve a problem, maybe within a tribe of other people that think the same way. Now, communications and visualizing, that's difficult. I have seen very many just wasted time trying to explain to an analyst maybe who, who, who designed the operation. And I'll take a step back, right? We see this in the movies or you hear a lot about it, like the operator, the operator, like it doesn't plan the whole mission. It's just not him, right? Like there's a whole team, you know, everybody thinks it's not like the, the F-35 pilot. That pilot has a lot of control on what he does with that aircraft as an officer, as an aviator and his electronic system. He gets to make different decisions and a whole bunch of other things that they're allowed to do versus, you know, the, the, the offensive cyber operator behind the keyboard. Sometimes, unfortunately, they've been called keyboard monkeys because they're the person that someone else thought they're going to make them do the job, but they're responsible for the task. Now, this is where communication really comes into play. A, understanding what we're getting ready to do and how we're getting ready to do it and through what. I would submit that unless you're the person who's really had to do red team offensive uh, or defensive cyber operations, you don't understand what it means to transcend <laughs> through this keyboard and this monitor, through the internet, right? And, and you know, in this kind of matrix of a world. And so that communications and visualization and shared cognition, if you would, of you know, hybrid space, what does it really mean to be to go through hybrid space, operate in hybrid space, and then communicate about what it is that we're going through, especially when the 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 pilot is the operator, right? He's the guy who's visual, every, visualizing everything through the keyboard. So communications from what I've researched from myself, that's what's always killed mission. That was actually also caused failure. We didn't communicate right, and the operator didn't understand what the analyst, and he hit enter, or he went to the wrong router, or he did the wrong X. So I think a communications in, you know, the ability to communicate not you know, not only to be understood, but also not to be misunderstood is huge. And that takes a toll on someone. And especially if we're kind of on two different planes, if I'm thinking one way or my understanding of the mission that we're about to do is X and you're thinking A, that's just going to cause in this high stress, again, the stress that an operator has to go through before they hit that key button or they're interpreting that data is huge. So how do I interpret the data that I see? With the analyst, how does an analyst interpret the data that they see to me? And then there's always that other factor in leadership, someone who has to make the, the uh, authority, especially in the military side of the house, who says, yes, you can use that tool. No, you can't use that tool. Yes, you can proceed. So I think communications is a, it's vital, as we've discussed. But then how do we communicate? How do we communicate and have that same visualization of what's going on? And, and then I would submit a little bit forward because there are some risks that the operator may see that he doesn't communicate to the analyst as well as the analyst may see like hey you're about to you know get into this this router and this router has this uh you know adversarial uh, detection capability and if we don't communicate you know it's kind of like the analogy of a fighter pilot that's why i like using aviation you know the pilot and the person that sits in the back they have to communicate very well or they're going to crash and die, or they're going to drop a bomb on something. So there's a there's a, a really well understood method uh, of what they're doing and how they have to communicate. So they're not understood, but they're not misunderstood. Because I think communications and how we communicate, um, I think it's vital. And it's also will help reduce some of the stress, right? If I can communicate efficiently with the team, if we and we've also understand what we're about to do, not only, hey, you're going to go hack this, but what does it mean? What are the risks? When we reach a risk and we have to make a decision point, how do we communicate effectively and timely 
so we can continue to move forward. There's a huge risk. I actually just spoke to uh, to a fellow operator, uh, and I wish I can find the word, but he actually had given me some key words on what he was dealing with. And so, yeah, it was uh, isolation. It, it, it's really, it's interesting because it was also emotions, right? You don't you don't think that someone's gonna. Uh, they're just explaining to me what they felt and what they view. And they were actually a cyber officer and they were explaining to me what you know they were assessing. And some of it was emotion and fault tolerant environment. What does a fault tolerant environment mean? Well, the first one is, hey, there's a lot of risk. And when there's risk and you're working with someone else, you need to communicate, right? And then also what happens is, what happens is if we're in a team and we're stressed out. We got to do this for a long time. And we just don't get along because we can't communicate. We don't have the same understanding, right? In a simple form, and you're going to feel isolated. You're going to feel like, hey, I, I'm not part of this team. I'm going to just keep this to myself. And that's not good in this world. Again, it's a, a high um, intellectual type work. You know, you have to remember a lot. You have there's a lot of risk. Um, you're worried about that, that risk tolerant of making a mistake. And here's the other thing, you know, and you get isolated is if they make a mistake, from my understanding now, that that's kind of like your hallway file. Like someone be like, ooh, that guy messed up. They made a mistake. They're not that good at Windows anymore. Uh, they, they're the ones that got caught or they they burned that tool. And now because they burned this tool for the next three months, we can't do operations or blah, 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 blah. So people get isolated. That's not a good feeling. Again, when we try to, and I, I can step back and go, I know what it is to have infantrymen, you know, in combat feel isolated. Because there are things that they couldn't process from more. Why did we shoot that guy? Why did my friend get blown up by a bomb, right? In, in the physical world, in that military world. But most of these are still military soldiers that have to think like a militant, if you would. But now they're in this cyberspace world with people of, of a unique personality. There are very few today in offensive cyber operators that came from combat arms. Actually, part of the survey that I'm about to do is actually asking did you start your military career as a cyber uh, officer or enlisted, or did you come from prior service? Because I, you know, I know from individuals that those that come from different branches in the military already come with different skills in resiliency, emotion, you know, maturity. They have a different life set. They understand, or they they come with problems. Did they come, unfortunately, with untreated post traumatic stress? Did they come with traumatic brain? Do they already have moral injuries? And maybe these are things that are not assessed. And I believe that that will factor into how we communicate and have this sort of uh, baseline. Yep, absolutely. No, Dave, I, I like that. Yeah, the, I, I don't think I really looked at, into it as the martial arts, um, you know, into a lot of the martial arts um, principles um, were key to at least the last 20 years that I did in special operations, right? We do a lot of combatives. We do a lot of, um, you know, exhausting the physical body uh, and what gets us through um, a lot of the me- the physical pains um, is is um, you know, not fighting through it, but we learn the skills. Of, we understand our bodies, we understand our minds, we understand our our limitations, and then how to how, how to perceive, you know, how to continue to go forward in this adversity and, and stuff like. That. And it's the same thing. Like we, you know, we can get into the combative sides of beating each other up and then having to do a task and what does it mean and. And we're very good at, okay, we lost or we didn't do good. Okay, let's think this through. Let's take lessons learned. Let's learn from that. Let's adapt and let's move forward. So interestingly, that's what uh, Dr. Spiliata actually wrote in Operational Cyber Psychology is taking some of not only the assessment and selection, but some of the world that comes from our elite, our special operations, um, you know, not only the combative side of it, but the mental side of it. What are the skills that these individuals have and process? And more importantly, how do, the, how do these organizations foster those? Because you can be as elite as you want, but if you're not inside of an organization that funds it, that maintains it, that makes it the culture of doing them, is you're, you're kind of an isolated person. And we saw that early on in special operations. We had a lot of folks that did their own thing. And then smartly, the commands went back and said, hey, what are you doing? Because we probably didn't think about doing jiu-jitsu. One of the big things in, in the special operations community is jiu-jitsu. So there's something from jiu-jitsu that teaches them principles that folks are utilizing in combat or learning or training. So I do love that, um, that, that aspect of, of bringing that in. And, and as I mentioned jokingly, but it is true, I'm also looking at the NASCAR uh, world, right? Because that's a, a society that has to do with high stakes, 
you know, high speed, very expensive cars that if there's a mistake, that driver can be shredded in pieces. And I'm looking at that individual in that world because it does make a clean break from not only drone drone pilots, but taking the private industry and seeing how the private industry is using it. You know, the, the analytical runs that I've done as I pull this research in, which is great because I get to look at all bodies of research in a variety of ways and take those lessons learned. Like mindfulness was a big one. I was doing mindfulness for a long time. And now how do I purposefully, after I left the military and sort of I left in this sort of Charlie Brown bubble of just confusion. And I've been able since post-military go, okay, let me go back to all of these skills that I learned. Let me uh, catalog everything I screwed up, right? And everything that I've been involved in. And then today, how do I um, essentially, as I do my studies every morning, I put into practice what I'm researching, right? Again, like I mentioned, I do mindfulness. I, I do deep work. I take a lot of these concepts and I'm cataloging them and I see how other folks, researchers are, are using it. Again, all the way from, from special operations to NASCAR drivers. Um, and I think there's another few other obscure, or not obscure, but a few other ones that are just helping the human be better. And I think that's kind of what we've been missing is forgetting about the human you know, nobody ever really thought that, you know, somebody in cybersecurity is going to have post-traumatic stress. Hey, it's not, it's not a disorder. It's just what they're dealing with because they don't understand it. And that's the huge part of post-traumatic stress is yeah, I don't understand what that traumatic, that traumatic event in my life is. But once I understand it, the mind is very powerful. We can get through it. We can grow. And I would submit, I like to be around people who have vulnerabilities because it's those people that don't have vulnerabilities that I'm scared of. The people that I was right next to in the back of an airplane, and we were about to jump out of a plane at night at 30,000 feet, if they tell me they're not scared, I'd rather put them and sit them down. Because if they're not part of that fear, it's actually what helps you think, right? And when, when someone's like, no, I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm not scared. Nope, that's the person I don't want to be around. So I actually value those that show their vulnerabilities because they're ready for growth. And they understand the mistakes that they've made, and they probably won't do it again. The shift work and messing up the circadian rhythm um, is huge, right? And so um, a lot of what I take from circadian rhythm is actually a lot of the research that's done, and, and probably later on I can share it, um, from the special operations community, because that's the, one of the number one things, as of more recent, that they really started to factor in. They're like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so the basis of uh, being an infantry guy or special operations is do a lot with less sleep. And then they realize, hey, man, wait a minute, that's kind of stupid. Right. There are other ways to measure um, your ability. You know, yeah, in, in the initial phase, we've got to see how you act when you're out of sleep, when you're tired, uh, because then that's when you're vulnerable to make a mistake is when you're tired, hungry, cold, scared, or you don't know. And, and, and the individual doesn't understand that. And then as of recent, as of recent, maybe the last 10 years, we realized, oh, crap, we really got to focus on the sleep and we got to get away from, you know, hey, Ranger up. You can work. You know, what is it? Die. Uh, I don't know. Don't it's sleep when you die. Like we realize that that's kind of kind of stupid. And then in particular, when people are transitioning, because that world of me sucking it up in the civilian world, it's just horrible. It's just you know. And once people leave the military, they're realizing that they weren't sleeping. They can't get back into a rhythm. And so the circadian rhythm and 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 the impact on it are huge. So that's why I mentioned like my aura ring. And there's a couple of other. Uh, there's a lot of research on there where they're using aura rings and other wearables that get to the point on sleeping, right? So I'm able to really quickly account for what I did today. Did I drink? Did I eat too late? Did I not get enough exercise? Because that's important. You got to get a certain amount of exercise, simply put, in order for the, you know, at least in the ring of the algorithm to go, hey, buddy, you didn't get enough of what exercise you needed. So this is going to, this is going to hurt your sleep. And then sure enough, when you're waking up and I check my app, it's like, yeah, buddy, uh, you're going to, you're going to be a little sluggish. You're not going to be, and I can relate what the data says to literally how I'm feeling. And I gradually start to change my habits. And I think that's huge, right? So I understand my habits. My family understands my habits. Um, I think in the military, the, again, the issue was we weren't understanding truly what that impact to shift work is. It's, Hey, suck it up. You got a mission to do. Well, wait a minute, guy. Why are we not looking? There's a rule in aviation. As you all know, sometimes you've been stuck in an airport and you're like, where are the pilots? They got to finish their crew rest because it's been studied. 
it's known and, you know, especially not to cause an airplane to fall out of the sky or crash because a pilot didn't get enough air crew rest. So something I've heard that they're kind of doing in some elements in cyber operations is looking at crew rest. Uh, but I think they need to do it more also on the physiological side is you gave them crew rest for 12 hours, but did that cyber operator know how to decompress? Did they know how to kind of shut off their brain and leave work where it's at and then get into those habits where they're not, they're not drinking, they're not overeating, they're not eating the wrong food, going to sleep too late or drinking a Red Bull right before they go to sleep, right? Which is disastrous. And I think once we use technology to start monitoring the circadian rhythm and that they were able to get into the right sleep. And I ended with like, I know that if I don't get my one hour and 20 something minutes of, of deep sleep, I'm going to have a shitty day the next day. Cause I see it cause I got to come behind these computers and start doing research. Um, and it's, you know, and stay focused on what I'm doing. Then I'm monitoring myself cause I'm also real time looking at my HVR. So circadian rhythm and work shifts and people being cognizant of, of how they're impacting someone's life. You can't just suck it up. <laughs> <laughs>